Sunset Overdrive was originally released in 2014 as an Xbox exclusive, in a move that was widely considered to be the end of Insomniac Games' long-term working relationship with Sony. That turned out not to be true, and the developers of the Spyro and Ratchet & Clank series have since published Song of the Deep, the Ratchet 1 remake, and Marvel Spider-Man to the PlayStation 4. Sunset Overdrive remains the only console game Insomniac have developed that wasn't released on any Sony system, and that's why, on release, Sunset Overdrive never crossed my PlayStation fanboy radar. Four years later, the game got a window release and it hit Steam in November 2018. Sunset Overdrive is a stylized, post-apocalyptic, parkour ninja 3D platformer shoot 'em up and one of the most fun games I've played in a long time. The developers called it a celebration of games, citing Prince of Persia and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater as inspirations, but to me it feels like Sly Cooper's got his hands on the guns from Ratchet & Clank, and that's high praise because those are my two favourite video game series of all time. But while I still remember every detail from the original Ratchet & Sly trilogies well over 15 years after their release, that that's not going to happen with Sunset Overdrive, because the great game hiding in here is undermined by some design flaws and lack of imagination from a development company that's where it is today because of its usually remarkable creativity. I really do like this game, and you're going to hear me remind you of that a few times along the way, but it is by no means perfect, and at times it is outright bad. This is going to be a detailed review, and as a warning, I will be talking about the entire plot of Sunset Overdrive. So, let's get into what Sunset Overdrive is. What is it? The game begins at the limited release product launch of Mega Corporation Fizco's new energy drink. You're there at the launch, but instead of enjoying the drinking and partying, you're working a dead end job picking up trash, and this is where everything goes wrong. Time for some extreme violence. As we'll later discover, Fizco has rushed overcharged through testing for some quick bucks, and the drink is now somehow so volatile and magic that instead of just being unhealthy, it completely transforms people into angry, violent, zombie, Cronenberg things that this game calls the OD. That makes zero sense at all, but it is the core of the game's plot, so it's the one big leap of faith I'm happy to give it. Normalist world, but Overcharged turns people into zombies, and anything critical I say about the story will be based on that universe. You're a parkour superstar, and as a result, you're one of the few people able to avoid the OD with dodge rolls, huge jumps and grind rails, and Sunset Overdrive drops you right into the action with a short tutorial section that really nails not only teaching you the controls, but also explaining the world. Because Sunset City is no normal city, Sunset City is a parkour playground. Pretty much every building in the game has a railing you can grind on, every street has overhead cables you can grind on, fences you can grind on, the billboards you can grind on them too, and everything you can't grind on is a bounce pad. Cars, bushes, air vents, awnings, boats, parasols, bins, picnic tables, all of them are bounce pads. This is where the similarities with the second and third Sly Cooper games comes in, because Sunset Overdrive is going to have you crossing a city over rooftops, staying off the ground wherever possible. It's also got the same method of keeping your movement fluid and mechanically lenient by using a single button to have the character automatically connect with rails. Circle in Sly, square in Sunset Overdrive. The map is designed to have blocky squares of buildings separated by narrow roads so players can easily chain together bounce pads and grinds to quickly navigate the city. Using these tricks, you manage to escape from a giant mutant OD and make it back to your home before the OD break down your barricades and we get our first human NPC, Walter. Walter runs a combat tutorial and then introduces you to Two Hat Jack, who will be selling you all the wacky guns that Insomniac have mostly plucked out of previous Ratchet & Clank titles, like the disc blade gun, the decoy glove, and the rhino from Ratchet & Clank 3. They even took the gun wheel out of Ratchet & Clank. I got guns too. Damn. Two Hat Jack also gives you a revolver called the Dirty Harry basically for free. It's the most generic gun in Sunset Overdrive and weirdly it's the best gun you'll have all game. If you can think of a better one, tell me in the comments because I'm pretty sure it's this. Also, in Ratchet & Clank, when you bought a gun it had these little cutscenes to really show it off, but in Sunset Overdrive buying a gun looks like this. What is that? That's the level of fanfare I expect when I buy groceries at the weekend. Anyway, after meeting Two Hat Jack, you're introduced to Floyd. He's the main missions hub for the game and also where you go for upgrades, so you'll be hearing from Floyd a lot. Hey, it's Floyd, just checking in. What are you, my mother? He teaches you the final details about combat, so this is a good point to talk about Sunset Overdrive's gameplay, which is where this title really shines. 
The OD are dangerously strong on the ground, and ranged enemies like scabs will hit every bullet if you move slowly, so the combat style in Sunset Overdrive is all about keeping yourself moving and keeping yourself elevated. But to make it more interesting, the game has what it calls a style meter. Every time you use a jump pad, start a new grind, or get a kill, you're given style points. Filling the style meter activates your upgrades. Oh, Sunset Overdrive loves breaking the fourth wall. Uh, why am I hearing disembodied voices? Some of these jokes are pretty good, and others, you know, not so much. There are three types of upgrade for you to customise your character. Weapons gain experience through use, like in Ratchet and Clank, and when a gun reaches level 2, you can equip a weapon amp. These are bonuses, like giving bullets a chance to stun enemies, or having some enemies explode when they die. You also have hero amps, and these give you a bonus like damaging enemies with your dodge roll, and throwing out a mini tornado with your melee attack. The way to get amps is by bringing ingredients to Floyd from around the city. These are the traditional 3D platformer collectibles that Sunset Overdrive has, and so when you travel around, you'll jump into Fizco balloons and smash security cameras whenever you see them. You bring Floyd the ingredients, and this starts an arena combat section where you place traps around the base to try to kill the OD before they can damage the vats where the amps are cooking. I wasn't a big fan of these. Scaling a fight down and making you circle around one area didn't make the most of the movement mechanics that the game is built on. I didn't fail a single one of these, but I also never felt like I played one very well. I was always having to drop down to the ground next to the vats to shotgun OD away from them, and it's the exact opposite of how the game is meant to be played. That's how you get the weapon and hero amps, but there's a third upgrade system called overdrives, and I liked overdrives way more. Anytime you perform any sort of action, you gained experience and eventually badges related to that action. These are my Wilderness Explorer badges. So if you grinded a lot, you got grinding badges, or if you used single shot weapons, you'd get single shot weapon badges. These badges can be traded in for perks, so you can get a badge that increases style point generation from using grinds, or one that increases damage dealt by single shot weapons. I love the way these work, because instead of you picking some stats, you improve on the parts of the game that you use most frequently. If you use a lot of grind rails, it makes sense that your character will become better at using grind rails. The combat is high paced and exciting from the very first moment, and it doesn't take long before chaining together bounces and grinds while shooting is second nature. Floyd sends you off to meet Walter again at the overpass where he's been building a helicopter to escape from the city, and in true video game fashion, you immediately break it. What a fuck up. Yeah. I meant you. Walter, pretty unreasonably I'd say, blames you and so you take it into your own hands to get the chopper fixed, and according to Floyd, the one part that's going to be difficult to replace is the propeller. You go out looking for one, and in the first place you search, you end up saving a student who's a nerd on par with the two-dimensional caricatures of the Big Bang Theory. He takes you to a new base, where several highly academic STEM students happen to all be hanging out, but not one of them is going to help you unless you pull off a series of tedious and meaningless tasks. One of the students needs you to find him some fancy bottled water or he's not going to help you, but along the way you end up having to repair the entire bottling plant, despite the fact that at the end you go and pick up some water from a kiosk. One girl wants you to go and find her robot dog that's hiding out in a park. Obviously it's not that simple though, because the dog decides it's not going to come with you unless you go and find its toy cat, so now you have to go and find a toy cat to bring to the toy dog to bring to the girl so that she can make you a propeller? Does that make any sense? No. The third guy wants to know if his parents are still alive or if they've been killed by the OD, and that's the only reasonable motivation here. It even gives the game an opportunity for this half-decent joke. Your mother and I are going to live in the Bahamas. We're cashing out your trust fund so mommy can drink a lot of champagne and... We should probably just tell him his parents were skeletons in a bathtub. Keep that mission and delete the other two, which add nothing to the game. In a few minutes' time, you get this cutscene. As Sam forgot one thing. If you don't help him, I'll throw your ass out on the street to fend for yourself. I'm on board with this. Hey, let's get to work. Cool speech. I'm ready. You could have just threatened them before doing the fetch quest, and so every single part of that mission was useless anyway. This is a good moment to talk about missions in Sunset Overdrive. They are rubbish. 90% of what you do are fetch quests, and the writing is really lazy. I want to point out that having a game full of fetch quests here is not as bad as it can be in other titles. In open world games like Fallout and The Elder Scrolls, fetch quests can be a pain, because they ask you to walk to a waypoint to collect a mission, walk to a new waypoint to collect an item, and then walk back to the location of the original waypoint. It's slow, tedious, and boring. 
In Sunset Overdrive, movement is key to the game's mechanics, and so asking a player to traverse the city looking for items is perfectly acceptable. The main issue is that there are almost no occasions in the game where the context of the mission gave me any additional motivation to complete them. So, the section of the game I just mentioned where you break the helicopter and then need to replace the propeller. What's the most important development in the narrative here in terms of progressing the plot? Well, it's making the propeller. But it's also the only thing that you don't actually do. It's a 3D printer. Your goal was to make it up to Walter by bringing him a new propeller, but what you actually did was find some bottled water, a dog, and a recording from the parents of someone that you've known for five minutes. The students actually make the propeller. Not only are you not directly driving the narrative forward, you barely feel relevant to it at all. The non-playable characters are the action heroes, and you're that guy that gets told to guard the door. That's the job they always give the coolest guy in the heist. To make it worse, you do all of this grunt work and then get treated like a hero. Makes me want to be a hero to this hero. Which doesn't seem to fit. Let's compare this to how missions are structured in Sly 2. I'm not saying there aren't any bad missions in the Sly series, and they definitely had their share of fetch quests and escort missions, but they all served a purpose. In the opening episode of Sly 2, you've got a mission that asks you to go to three waypoint markers to reposition three satellite dishes so that Bentley can hack them. Another one is a slow escort mission where you sneakily follow your Mark Dimitri to discover where his secret base of operations is. Bentley has a playable mission where he has to put bombs on four structural supports inside a building. The missions themselves aren't anything special. Much like Sunset Overdrive, they just involve moving to a waypoint marker and pressing a button, but there's a purpose to them. You need the satellite info to work out Dimitri's operation. You need the escort mission to find his secret base and you need the four bombs to weaken the sports of the peacock sign to do this. You can see each mission building up towards some sort of finale. So I gave myself one minute to come up with a replacement for the find a propeller segment of Sunset Overdrive and this is what I came up with. How about, to get the propeller, you have to steal it from an old school plane somewhere in a museum? Unfortunately, there was an overcharge spill around the museum and the ground is just overflowing with OD, so you can't get to the door. You can go in through the wall, but you're going to need some sort of blasting jelly or C4, and that's fetch quest number one. The building is filled with OD on the inside as well, and you're going to need to get the propeller off the plane quickly without damaging it, so you can't use a sword. Sam comes up with the idea of using a Formula One style wheel gun, and there's a local racing team that probably left one behind for fetch quest number two. Then you actually use the blasting jelly to break in, kill a few OD, use the wheel gun and then get out of there with the propeller. It's the same three missions for one goal structure that Sunset Overdrive will use throughout the game, but now it gives each fetch quest a purpose because they're clearly vital for the mission. It also puts your character in a position to be driving the plot forward by actually getting the propeller yourself, and when you're praised like a hero at the end, you can feel like you deserved it. This isn't a great piece of writing by any means, but it's miles ahead of what's actually in the game. Adding in my first reminder at this point that I do like Sunset Overdrive. If I didn't, I wouldn't care this much about the poorly written missions. This is a good game that really should have been a great game if it weren't for flaws like this holding back the overall experience. Here was another one. If you're an eagle-eyed viewer, you might notice that I'm switching between using a keyboard and a controller. Now, when I play a high-intensity online first-person shooter like Overwatch, then I want to be using my mouse and keyboard for deadly precision aiming. What can I say? That's just how I roll. But when I'm playing a single-player game, I prefer a more relaxed experience where I can chill and lean back with a controller. Sunset Overdrive definitely fits into that second category, but I still couldn't figure out how I preferred to play. The reason is that Sunset Overdrive is all about shooting zombies while jumping around and grind railing, but jumping and grinding are bound to X and square, and aiming is done with a right analog stick. To be able to play Sunset Overdrive properly with a controller, you'd need two right thumbs, and the game doesn't let you rebind the controls. Playing with a keyboard, I could bind things to extra buttons on my mouse, but using four directional WASD instead of an analog stick definitely isn't the way I want to move in this movement focused game. I think by this point that adding at least basic controller customization should be essential to any video game and I'm disappointed that Insomniac didn't add it in to Sunset Overdrive. This also had a knock on effect in really hurting some of the guns. Sunset Overdrive broadly classes its guns as being either rapid fire or single shot. To effectively deal damage with automatic weapons, you have to track your reticule to target enemies. With single shot weapons, you only need to aim for the moment you press fire. Because the controls don't let you continuously aim while moving, the single shot weapons were just always better. You can start grinding, quickly make a kill in one or two shots, and then chain together another jump and grind. Single shot weapons with high impact damage are also more effective against stronger enemies like Fizco robots and Giant OD, which are the only threatening enemies in the game. The variety and creativity of the weapons Insomniac made for Ratchet and Clank and then put in Sunset Overdrive are one of the best parts of this game, and it's frustrating that half of them have been made really awkward to use. 
Getting back into the story though, you've got a new propeller and start your escape. For some reason, you're piloting the helicopter and not Walter, but I guess it's expected of 3D platformers to have mini games and vehicles, and they aren't always great, so I won't complain too much about the ones in Sunset Overdrive, which... Yeah, they aren't great either. The plane is awful to pilot, the wrecking ball mission is too easy, and aiming the radars to snoop in on conversations is painfully uninteresting. By the way, you do this like 10 times in the game and it's 10 times too many. Just as you're about to escape the city, Walter notices a pigeon bite the dust and realises that the whole place has been surrounded by a Fizco invisible shield. Yeah, Fizco are a big enough company to have robot soldiers and invisible shields, but still small enough to care about releasing an energy drink. This is another Insomniac game with a theme about consumerism and corporate greed, but in Sunset Overdrive the satire isn't as strong as it has been in previous titles. In Ratchet & Clank, the big bad was a mega businessman, but every other aspect of the game reinforced the idea. You couldn't do anything without somebody trying to get money out of you. I think I see the problem. What? Now even the computers are charging us? That's it. This galaxy flows. In Sunset Overdrive, Fizco may be terrible, but there isn't anybody that you meet who isn't willing to give you large amounts of their time and resources in exchange for small favours. Walter manages to chuck you out of the helicopter, but he doesn't make it in time. This leads onto a cutscene where you and Floyd have a little memorial for Walter, and then Floyd lets you know about a guy called Brill Cream who might be able to think of a way past the invisible wall. Brill Cream? What kind of a name is that? Brill Cream was the leader of a scout unit, but he was betrayed by another scout who wanted to replace him as leader. A girl called Forkim gets kicked out of the troop and ends up sticking around with Sam the nerd from the previous missions and they become a little duo over the intercom. Long story short, you find Brill Cream, he's a quadruple amputee, and in true Sunset Overdrive fetch quest style, you pick him up and take him to a waypoint marker. Classic. He draws up plans for a boat and tells you where you can go and find someone who can build it. For free, thankfully. If this was Ratchet and Clank, he'd have wanted some sort of payment first. Sell? After we just saved your scrawny butt? So the guy Brill Cream sends you off to find is really into live action role playing. He's also very sick when you arrive and so naturally that means another fetch quest for you, except this time there's an element of escort mission thrown in there and we know how much people love escort missions. Exciting stuff. Once again, Sunset Overdrive can't help but pad out its quests with meaningless repetition. The king is sick, so he needs food. You have a full mission to go out and get him some tree bark, which obviously doesn't work, and then straight after that, there's another combined escort plus fetch mission to bring him some cooked pigeons. After that, the king needs some medicine. There was no additional writing here, just three near identical storylines where zero could easily have sufficed. Admittedly, the medicine mission is pretty cool. You drink a whole bottle of something and start tripping. In your druggy state, you have to chase down a Fizco balloon while imagining that the floor is lava. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Roaming the city without touching the ground is exactly the sort of challenge that makes the most of Sunset Overdrive's strongest mechanics, and the trippy medicine is a great way to introduce it. They should have found a way to have more quests like this. You finally get the LARPA King to build you a boat, and once again it happens off screen. Another full section of the game has been completed where you were never directly affecting the main narrative. It's a shame that the mission where you use this boat and the floor is lava mission are so close together because they're the two best missions in the game. Neither is incredible, they're just... good. And unfortunately in Sunset Overdrive, that makes them stand out. Your job is to keep the boat safe as you head out of the city to the ocean, and you'll need to balance fighting the enemies, getting ahead of the ship to open drawbridges and grabbing rubbish, yep, actual rubbish, to fix the ship. Picking up items and killing OD has been the core of every mission so far, but here you've got the freedom to do it in whatever order you like. You can go on an OD killing spree, or just back yourself to pick up enough trash to keep the boat alive through all the damage. More importantly though, this is a mission where you are directly driving the plot forward. This is you finally escaping Sunset City, it's a big part of the story, and for once, it isn't happening off camera. Just as you escape the city though, you get a message from Sam, and the game's plot moves from being just about escaping the city to getting revenge on Fizco. 
The way the overall story works in Sunset Overdrive is you do some fetch quests for one group, then for another, and then another in linear fashion, with only one active mission at a time. Even though in Sly Cooper every mission was mandatory, you were often given several at once, and the ability to choose which ones to do when really added to how involved you were in the story. This would have been possible in Sunset Overdrive if the quest writing wasn't so directionless. The next group you have to impress is Las Cantrinas, who live in an abandoned hospital looking after sick children. The reason you want them is unclear. They're not mentioned at all until one of them shows up in a cutscene for all of two seconds. Was that a ninja cheerleader? But after this, you're certain that they're the people you need to take down Fizko. Naturally, they refuse to help and you have to do some more poorly written fetch quests to make them your friend. Your character even makes a joke about it. Here's how this is gonna go. First I'll run some errands for you, then you'll like me, and then you'll help me. Not gonna happen. You do realise though, right, that making a joke about how bad your missions are doesn't make your missions less bad? This is the video game equivalent of girls on Twitter who describe themselves as being hard to handle as though it's a positive or purely unavoidable. If you were mocking generic uninspired fetch quests while bringing something new and original, then this would be funny. Stuart Lee doesn't mock generic observational comedy while performing generic observational comedy because that would be hypocritical and hollow. One of the missions asks you to make a sword to impress Las Contrinas, and I won't get into details about the mission because it's not great, but it does let me talk about this. Oh, can't forget, I can fast travel. The whole game is about traversing the environment, but apparently there's no confidence that the movement is enjoyable enough to cross the map without fast traveling. Good thing this game has fast travel. So either the movement isn't good enough, or maybe the map is too big, and it's definitely the second one. As you sprint around from waypoint to waypoint, you'll notice that this section of the map here looks just like this one, and this one. It's all normal buildings and normal cars and normal roads, there's nothing that really stands out. The strongest guiding landmark is probably the river running through the city, but that only helps if you're already right next to it. Note that this reminder about the fast travel option happens in the middle of a mission. The power plant that the game wants you to go to is only used once, and it's for this mission, so I don't understand why they didn't just place it closer to Las Cantrinas' hideout. Eventually, you get Las Cantrinas on your side, and now it's the game's finale. You don't actually do any missions with them, you just get them on your side and then start the end game. You call Sam the nerd and ask him to get everyone together. Everyone, in this instance, is him, the king of the LARPers, the amputee scoutmaster, Fork him, and the new Las Cantrinas girl. Oh, and also this guy. Buck National runs the game's side missions. Earlier in Sunset Overdrive, you need a new computer processor and you try to steal one from Buck. He agrees to just give it to you if you go out into the city and film yourself doing some cool stuff like you're Peter Parker and he's J.K. Simmons. Don't worry about dying. That looks good on camera too. He has no interest in you or your plans, he just wants footage for his movies. The mission asks you to do things like kill 5OD while bouncing or 5OD while grinding, and it was so boring that I didn't go back to him for any extras. Yet, here he was, on the bridge with me. The whole getting the gang together trope is a pretty common way of wrapping up video games and actually quite a lot of stories in general, but here it falls really flat. I was disappointed when I played Insomniac's Ratchet reboot and realised that they had removed almost all of the one-off NPCs, so I'm glad that Sunset Overdrive does have a varied supporting cast, but while all of them are distinct, none is particularly interesting or memorable. You've known the last Cantrinas girl for all of 30 seconds, and the two of you have never even worked together. The King of the LARPers was unconscious for most of his segment of the game. You do have a mission with Scoutmaster Brill Cream, but he's basically just the object of a fetch quest. The only person you've really spent any time with is Sam, and he's such a generic two-dimensional character that you could throw him into the Big Bang Theory and he wouldn't stand out. There actually is one interesting character in the game. Can you see him? Well, you can't, because he's not here. It's Floyd. Floyd is the only character in the game that seems to have an actual personality and any depth to him. You know he's got the mad scientist angle going on, but he's also funny and seems to care about your character rather than just handing you some instructions. Floyd actually has this thing where he keeps talking about the apocalypse as an opportunity to become a new person. He calls it the... Awesome apocalypse! 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 These comments are definitely directed at you, and it feels like Sunset Overdrive wanted to have a story where you transition from being just some guy to being a hero. Again, there are similarities to Ratchet and Clank, but from the very first missions in Sunset Overdrive, you're clearly already a hero. Makes me want to be a hero to this hero. 
There isn't a moment in the game where you aren't willing to risk your life to help someone else out. At the end of the boat mission, where you find out Fizzco are attacking the city and you choose to go back and save your friends, this is probably the point at which the transition to hero was meant to be fully realised, but based on your actions so far in the game, it's what I'd have expected you to do at any point. Wouldn't it have been a great opportunity though in this final mission to have Floyd jump out from behind his bar and put his life on the line to take down Fizzco? That Floyd guy, he's the hero of this game. When he talks about the apocalypse being... It's our chance to be whoever we want to be. He could have been talking about himself. You may not have a character arc in the game, but it would have been nice if somebody did. Floyd is the only character from Sunset Overdrive that I'm going to remember, and he's not here. Instead, you get Buck National. Great. You have to fight some waves of robots as a distraction while Las Cantrina sneaks Sam into the Fizco headquarters through the sewers. Except the plan changes when Sam realises he can't hack the computers to shut down Fizco's mystery superweapon. So you do three missions begging Las Cantrinas to help you, zero missions actually working with them, chuck them into a finale alongside characters you've known all game, and then they don't actually do anything? God, I hate the writing in this game. What if we just destroy the whole building? You end up needing to destroy the building, and apparently the best way to do that is by using a fake promotional store sign in the shape of an overcharge bottle that's actually filled with overcharge. Why? Who knows? You unnecessarily jump on the bottle in a kamikaze fashion just as a setup for another meta joke about video games where you die and then respawn in front of your friends, and then the real endgame begins. The super weapon Fizco are planning on unleashing is revealed not to be a bomb or anything, but a super robot that is the Fizco headquarters. This is a great idea for a mission because it combines fighting enemies with scaling buildings and it made me wish that this game had given up on all realism and just created a modern day sci-fi rock and roll version of Shadow of the Colossus because climbing up the Fizgo robot was a really solid idea. There's a mission similar to this in Sly 3 where you have to climb a giant version of Carmelita Fox. Unfortunately, all the puzzle is taken out of this mission straight away. Thanks Sam, don't give me a moment to think about it myself, I'll just follow your every command. So you climb up to the top doing exactly what all the other characters tell you to do. Use the train tracks to get to the top yeah. of the robot! And you blow up the building and win the game. There's a little party to remind us of all the bland 2D characters we had along the way. Roll credits, game over, short little movie that sets up a possibility of a sequel, blah blah blah, and we're done. So, this was a long video. Not by some people's standards, but certainly compared to what I normally write. The reason I wanted to get into Sunset Overdrive in so much detail is because it had such potential to be a fantastic game. If every mission and human character had been stripped out of Sunset Overdrive and it was just a sandbox game where you kill OD to get money, to get guns, to kill OD in new and creative ways, I'd still have liked it because it's just so much fun to play. I do like Sunset Overdrive, I really like it but I don't love it. It really feels like an opportunity missed for Insomniac to have made a golden age 3D platformer in the post Grand Theft Auto world. Ratchet and Clank and Sly Cooper have stayed with a lot of video gamers not just because they were fun to play, but because both had excellent writing with stories and characters to connect to. There's just nothing in the story or the characters of Sunset Overdrive to make the game memorable. I don't appreciate the game at all beyond the mechanics, and despite that, I still highly recommend anyone who's a fan of shooters or 3D platformers to play it. Insomniac aren't done with the franchise just yet, or at least they don't want to be. Sunset Overdrive 2 is still a possibility. In an interview with IGN, Insomniac CEO Ted Price said, When you establish an IP, you know what the tone is, you know what the character is, you know what the core mechanics are that work. So doing a sequel for any game, be it Sunset Overdrive or something else, is an opportunity to deliver something to fans that's significantly better than the original, and that's something that I think we would love to do someday. Insomniac are keen, but they just need interest from a publisher, and I hope they get it. There's a really strong foundation here. If Sunset Overdrive 2 does happen, and its story and characters give us a reason to connect with a game on a deeper level than just its mechanics, then I'm sure it's going to be a masterpiece. If you've got to the end of this video, first of all, well done. That cannot have been easy, and secondly, thank you so much for watching. I've got a whole catalogue of other reviews to take a look at if you're interested, and if you want, you can subscribe to the channel and follow what I write in the future. Thank you so much again for watching, and goodbye.